So this is the physical science lesson video for section 4.1 and as always if you want my videos in one spot then just subscribe to my channel. So in chapter 4 we're going to talk about atomic structure. I know it's kind of hard to see but I did green on green. I'm not really sure why. So Democritus believed that all matter consisted of extremely small particles that could not be divided. He called these particles atoms. Isaiah Rodriguez, come to the attendant's office. Isaiah Rodriguez, to the attendant's office. Okay, there we go. All right, so he called these particles atoms from the Greek word atomos, meaning indivisible. He thought that there were different types of atoms with specific sets of properties. So for his time period, this was a big idea. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Following students, please report to the counseling office. Hmm. To my relief. Hopefully this is not a lot of stuff. Elijah Livingston, please report to the counseling office. Okay, so then came Aristotle. Aristotle did not think that there was a limit to the number of times matter could be divided. So he thought you could just keep dividing it indefinitely. Aristotle thought that matter could be broken up into fire, air, water, and earth. So if you've ever watched like uh, Airbender, Avatar Airbender, or anything like that, it was kind of based on that. But as we know now, that was not accurate. So Dalton later developed a theory to explain why elements and compounds always join the same way. So why is water always H2O? Why isn't it sometimes H2O3 or something like that? So Dalton proposed the theory that all matter is made up of individual particles called atoms, which is from Democritus, which cannot be divided. So he kind of went back to what Democritus thought. So he came up with his theory and so there are four parts to Dalton's atomic theory. And the first part is all atoms are, I mean, all elements are composed of atoms. All atoms of the same element have the same mass, and atoms of different elements have different masses. The third part is compounds contain atoms of more than one element. And his fourth idea was in a particular compound, atoms of different elements always combine in the same way. So atoms are made of elements. Atoms of the same element have the same mass. Different elements have different masses. Uh, compounds contain more than one element, and elements always combine in the same way when they're making the same type of compound. So Dalton believed that each type of atom is represented by a tiny solid sphere with a different mass. So he, they still didn't know about the whole protons, neutrons, electrons, and electron cloud and all that kind of stuff. At this point in time, they just thought it was like a little ball. So Thomson's atomic theory. When some materials are rubbed, they gain the ability to attract or repel other materials. So, like I can rub a balloon on my hair, and then I can get that balloon to stick to the wall. Based on their behavior, such materials are said to have either a positive or negative electric charge. Some charged particles can flow from one location to another. A flow of charged particles is called an electric current. Okay, so we've talked about this back when we talked about electricity. So, for example, if you comb your hair a lot, you will charge the comb. And then if you hold it to water that's dripping downward, it will cause the water to bend towards the comb or away from it. depends on what charge the comb has at that point. So Thomson used a cathode ray tube to study atoms. A cathode ray tube is a glass tube filled with a gas that is, a, uh, is attached to a source of electric current. The beam created is the cathode ray. So it's kind of like a long tube, and when you power it through electricity, you get a beam of light. So think about maybe like the fluorescent light bulbs that are in the ceiling, something like that. And so the beam of light is called the cathode ray. So what he did was he was wondering what is the cathode ray made of? Like what is the light itself, that beam, what is it made of? So he put a positive and negative plate on either side of the beam. And then when he turned the beam on, he found that the beam traveled towards the positive plate. So instead of going in a straight line, it bent towards the positive. But what do we know about charges? What would attract to a positive plate? A negative charge would, because we know opposites attract. So once he saw that happen, Thomson concluded that the particles in the cathode ray have a negative charge, and he called them electrons. All right, so he used that cathode ray to determine that there are negative particles, which he called electrons. So Thomson's experiments provided the first evidence that atoms are made up of even smaller particles. So in other words, there's something else besides just a ball. Since atoms are neutral, Thomson's model shows a positively charged area with electrons scattered throughout. This is known as the plum pudding model. So what he thought was there was just kind of this big positive, I used to say like a force field, a big positive force field with electrons throughout. 
because the thing is they know most items or most objects are neutral, so you have to have the same amount of positive and negative. So there has to be something to balance out that negative charge. So he just put it kind of in a positive force field. It's called plum pudding model because that was a popular dessert um, in Europe. We don't really eat it so much here, so I refer to it as chocolate chip cookie model. So your cookie would be the positive force field and your chocolate chips would be your electrons. So Rutherford decided to test Thomson's plum pudding model. So Rutherford shot alpha particles at gold foil. Alpha particles are just a double positive helium atom. And so if the plum pudding model was correct, the alpha particles would pass through with slight deflection. So in other words, if the plum pudding model was correct, when those double positive particles encounter that positive force field, they should be able to make it through, but they would kind of deflect on their way through because two positives, they don't interact well. They want to repel. But it should be able to pass through the force field but deflect a little bit. Deflect just means bend. So instead of just going straight through, it will kind of bend as it passed through. However, that's not what actually happened. Most of the alpha particles actually passed straight through with no deflection. Some did deflect, but some actually hit and bounced back. So if you look, here's like the atomic level. So some of the particles, they passed straight through with no deflection. Some did deflect, which meant they kind of skimmed the side of something. And some hit and actually bounced back. So they must have actually hit another particle instead of just passing through a force field. So what did Rutherford come up with? Well, this led Rutherford to the conclusion that there was a dense positive charge in the center of the atom, which of course we know as the nucleus, and that most of the atom is empty space. So all of these particles that just pass straight through, they just pass through the electron cloud. There's nothing to hit in that case. So they pass straight through. The ones that did bend or deflect, they kind of skimmed the side of the nucleus. And then the ones that hit the nucleus dead on were the ones that ended up bouncing back. So Rutherford, in other words, disproved the plum pudding model. So Rutherford called the center of the atom the nucleus, and the nucleus is the dense, positively charged mass located at the center of the atom. According to Rutherford's model, all of an atom's positive charge is concentrated in the nucleus. So now we get something that you would recognize more when we're talking about an atom. So you have your protons and neutrons in the nucleus and the electrons in the electron cloud. So what theory did Dalton propose about the structure of the atom? Well, if you remember, for Dalton, he thought that your atom was like a solid sphere. Okay, for Dalton, he proposed that the structure of the atom was it was just a solid sphere. Number two, what evidence did J.J. Thompson provide about the structure of the atom? Well, remember, J.J. Thompson used the cathode ray tube to discover the electron. So J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. Number three, what did Rutherford discover about the structure of the atom? Well, he actually discovered two things. One, he discovered the nucleus. And two, he discovered it is mostly empty space. The atom is mostly empty space. So Rutherford discovered the nucleus and discovered that the atom is mostly empty space. And then number four, what evidence did Thompson have that his glowing beam contained negative particles? Well, if you remember, he put the positive and negative plate. It bent towards the positive plate. So you can say the cathode ray bent towards the positive plate. And we know opposites attract. So it had to be made of negative particles. Number five, why was Dalton's model of the atom changed after Thompson's experiment? Well, remember, Dalton's model was it was just a sphere, a solid sphere. So once Thompson discovered electrons, we had to somehow put electrons in there. So why was it changed? Because Thompson discovered electrons. The atom itself actually was made of smaller particles. And then number six, if you observed a beam of particles that bent toward a negatively charged plate, what might you conclude? Well, remember, we know opposites attract, so if something's attracted to a negative plate, it must be positively charged. So we could say the beam of particles is positively charged. And then number seven, in the Rutherford experiment, why weren't all the alpha particles deflected? Well, remember, some hit the nucleus and bounce backwards, but a lot of them just pass straight through the electron cloud. Okay, so the ones that, because most of the atoms empty space, so since most of the atoms empty space, the ones that pass through the electron cloud did not deflect in any way. All right, so hopefully now you understand a little bit more about the history of the atom and how we determined what the different parts were.